Hello again, everybody, and welcome to this special episode of Coco and Dalts. It's the Oscar nominations. They're out today. What? What? Oh, we need a theme, don't we? We totally need a theme. <laughs> That's not going to be our theme. Ba 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 ba. Oscars. Ba ba ba. So Why don't you get right on that? <laughs> we'll take a vote. We're going to have a vote later on in the show to see what our theme will be. We should have a, th- a different theme every week. I like it. I think that's a good idea. Theme song. Yeah. Um, before we get to Oscar nominations and our take on this very important subject, Coco has a very important subject to discuss as well. I do. I have an update for our legions of fans. <laughs> That's the graphic at the bottom <laughs> that says update. Update. <laughs> <laughs> for our legions of fans who listen to this podcast, which anybody who would like to sponsor us and give us money will totally get a return on that investment from our <laughs> legions of followers. Uh, in episode four, we discussed the pay disparity between Marky Mark and Michelle Williams for the reshoots of All the Money in the World involved when Christopher Plummer replaced Kevin Spacey. In that role, we're not going to get into all the details surrounding that again, but Marky Mark got $1.5 million for the reshoots. Michelle Williams got 80 bucks a day because she did it for Union Scale. We have new information. We do. We have new information. We have since uh, discovered that for the original production of the movie, when Kevin Spacey originally shot it before they had to go back and do the reshoots, Marky Mark got $5 million. Michelle Williams got $625,000. And they both have roughly the same amount of screen time. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Aside from the fact that Marky Mark today got nominated for a Razzie yeah. for his work in Transformers The Last Night. I believe that's the name of it because I somehow... You didn't see Transformers? The I didn't. Transformers? I didn't even know that that was actually a movie. Somehow <laughs> I completely missed the fact that that was made and released. So way to go, Marky Mark. You got paid for being... A below mediocre white man. So those are completely unrelated, the Razzies and that news that you just shared, I'm sure. Yes, because that was not uh, a Razzie nom for his work in All the Money in the World. Exactly. But still. All right. So thank you for that update, Coco, fresh from the newsroom. Wacha! Wacha! <laughs> Updates at the bottom of the screen. We if have, you were watching. We have not been drinking today. Not just yet. FYI. Well, yeah, not yet. maybe not one of us hasn't. Well, when you're talking, I can go get us some beer or something. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Oscar nominations. Woo! Yeah. Well, I forgot the theme of that one already. I don't know. So Oscar nominations came up. We're very excited. We were so excited, as a matter of fact, that with a, uh, a, a sign of pure terror, a reaction of pure terror, I realized that we had only seen <laughs> two of the movies that were nominated. <laughs> so I rushed out today. I bailed on my high-paying day job and went and saw two movies today that had been nominated as Best best Picture. Which two movies did you see today, Daltz? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that, Coco. (laughs) Thank you for asking. Hard-hitting journalism here at the Coco and Daltz podcast. (laughs) I wasn't prepared, but I'll just wing it. Uh, So I saw The Darkest Hour, and I also saw The Shape of Water, two movies that you... uh, indicated to me would be fine if I went to see them by myself while you were rolling in your day job money. (laughs) I would go see The Darkest Hour, The Shape of Water. I'm not really a Guillermo del Toro fan. He's just a little too out there for me. So So, I'm I'm cool with you seeing that one by yourself. So summaries of both movies. Okay, yeah, moving on. For people that have not (laughs) seen them, aren't familiar with them, uh, maybe want to see them or don't want to see them, uh, on the fence about either. So The Darkest Hour is about, it's essentially uh, the story of how Winston Churchill came to power, um, how uh, he got in office just before uh, the United Kingdom got into uh, World War II. And it's the events leading up to his famous speech of we will not surrender in front of the House of Parliament. Um, this, uh, and so Gary Oldman plays Winston Churchill Uh, A fantastic role. Uh, Gary Oldman is also nominated uh, as the best best actor. actor. Um, I, uh, looking at the other lead actors, uh, we've only seen uh, Get Out, which is uh, Daniel Kaluuya. We we apologize if we pronounce that incorrectly. Well, you don't have to apologize for me. I just blew, I totally brutalized. I don't know it. how to say it either. So, so uh, that's the only other actor I've seen, and uh, but I will say that Gary Oldman, his his performance was fantastic. Uh, 
you forgot that he was acting. You thought that you were actually watching Winston Churchill in action. Wow. Um, the makeup and the prosthetics and everything like that really helped that, obviously. Um, but he was fantastic. I'd say it's one of the best uh, acting jobs that I've seen in a long, long time. Wow. I was just really blown away by his work. Um, I should uh, also, for those who don't know who Gary Oldman is, he's uh, Commissioner Gordon <laughs> in some of the Batman movies. Oh, wow. So talk about range. <laughs> what I should have said was Commissioner Gordon as Winston Churchill. That, I mean, it's all law enforcement. So. Right, yeah. right. It's, it, it's sort of legislative and, and right. responsible. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was a great movie. I think that um, we've got uh, The Darkest Hour is also nominated as a Best Picture. I thought it was very well done. There wasn't a lot of um, battle scenes in this movie, so it was it was very well done in terms of building tension and building around events that you couldn't see. So as the Germans are pushing the, the British soldiers closer and closer to the English Channel and, and becoming closer and closer to, or coming closer and closer to actually uh, owning Europe and dominating Europe um, as some other countries fall, like France is beginning to fall and surrender. Um, but you build a lot. There's a lot of tension and drama and, and intrigue and everything like that without actually seeing warfare. So it was very well done. The script was very well done. The acting, the ensemble was very good. And so, again, I would say Gary Oldman, Commissioner Gordon, good job. Is that your pick for Best Actor? Yes. Based on the two performances that we have seen? Yes. So Call Me By Your Name, uh, Timothy Chalamet, I believe. Uh, I heard that is a very good performance. Daniel Day-Lewis in Phantom Thread. I mean, he's Daniel Day-Lewis. He's Daniel Day-Lewis, and apparently this is his last role. And by saying that, I'm wondering if he's fishing a little bit for one more Oscar. <laughs> I mean, he's got three. Right. You know? It's not like he's got Don't a be greedy. Of right. Yeah, don't be greedy. I wouldn't be surprised if he came back in like 20 years to do like King Lear or something, though. I mean, like a, in, in community theater, <laughs> he's going to be up at like the Shakespeare Company in the Berkshires, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Old and grizzled. Yeah, <laughs> we're or there. Maybe down to Mohegan Sun or one of the casinos <laughs> right. or something like that. <laughs> we're there if he. Uh... Daniel Day Lewis in. <laughs> I don't care what. Hello, it costs. Dolly. <laughs> right, we're there. <laughs> The other nomination for uh, other nominee for lead actor, of course, Denzel Washington, who gets nominated in everything Which, that he is in. And this is another movie, just like Transformers: The Last Night. I had never heard of so, until, and I'm sure Denzel is in a Transformers like quality movie. So. You think so? <laughs> yeah, I think he's got better. <laughs> better. I think he's got better advice than. Well, speaking Marky of Mark. speaking of people who get nominated just for breathing, Meryl Meryl Streep nominated True. for the post for best actress. True. So and so that's a good segue to The Shape of Water because Sally Hawkins is nominated as lead actress in that. Uh, I saw The uh, Shape of Water today in uh, the double bill of uh, an event that I may or may have not. <laughs> Paid for both movies. But you bought an overpriced box of candy. I did. So. I felt bad enough that I yeah. bought a $4.50 bag of peanut butter M&Ms. Maybe they can trace me. Can they trace me by revealing that information? Oh, they, well. I didn't pay with credit card. Oh, okay. So we're good. All right. So Sally Hawkins was fantastic. Talk about uh, Gary Oldman's performance in The Darkest Hour. Sally Hawkins plays Mute in... Uh, so the, the Shape of Water is a Guillermo del Toro movie. And Guillermo del Toro is, uh, as Coco said, a little bit out there. Um, and this movie is about essentially a woman who is mute. She can't speak. She can hear, but she can't mute, can't uh, uh, speak. She falls in love with essentially what is like the creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh. That's kind of what he looks like, mm -hmm. only it's uh, set in the, it seems like the 50s or the 60s. We don't really know mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Uh, Michael Shannon is the... Uh, hard ass uh, government guy who's trying to get to the bottom of this and may or may not be killing the creature wow. from the Black Lagoon. Michael Shannon, flawless and everything, yet did not get nominated for anything. So there's Just a slide there, I think. Um, yeah. he was Sorry powerful. to derail. But, not yeah. derail at all. This is this is adding to what we're talking about. This is value added, what you just said there. <laughs> um, I thought he was he was very powerful. He he plays that same kind of angry like, you just don't know when he's going to go off. I, I was first introduced to him uh, during uh, the movie with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, and it was the divorce movie that I 
can't think of it right now. Revolutionary, Revolutionary Road. Revolutionary Road. Yeah. Revolution. Revolutionary Rev- Road with Revolutionary. Kate Winslet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See that he was fantastic in that. He was uh, he had a bit part in that, but that was the first time I saw him. And he was the mentally challenged son of of the neighbors to Leonardo and Kate. And he was he he owned every scene that he was in. He wasn't in very many scenes. And ever since then he's been good in pretty much everything he's seen. So he was good in that. Um, the but Sally Hawkins falls in love with the creature from the Black Lagoon. It's a very touching, weird, romantic love story. Um, I went to see that first because it was filmed partially in Toronto and partially in Hamilton, which is nearby. Oh wow! And so you can tell in part of the scenes. I said, "Hey, I've been there, I've been there." So uh, very good movie. Uh, not as good as the Darkest Hour or Darkest Hour, as it is officially listed. Um, but Sally Hawkins' performance is worthwhile. The other lead actress nominees, Frances McDormand for three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, which we have not seen, but it's Frances McDormand, so formidable uh, competition there. I'm uh, going to have a controversial hot take. I didn't... Wait a minute, should we, have a, we need a banner at the bottom <laughs> of the screen? Hot take! <laughs> controversial! <laughs> <laughs> That's like flames and stuff. Yeah. That wasn't somebody urinating. Pure, uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I almost said a naughty word and I caught myself. So I, thank you. I apologize. Our, spons- um, our many, many sponsors, thank you yes. for that. I, uh, I thought she was really annoying in Fargo. Yeah, that's right. That was controversial. Yeah. Because that was a, a lead uh, role for the ages, really. Yeah, everybody loves that movie. Everybody loves her in it. I thought her character was very, very annoying in that movie. Yeah. I, I didn't especially enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I disagree with you. But I'm, I thought it was a... I, but yes, I can see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, other nominees in lead actress category: Margot Robbie, uh, Robbie, I should say, in *I Tanya*, which we're totally going to go see. Which we're totally going to go see. Um, do you want to pronounce uh, the Lady Bird nominees? Uh, <laughs> Saoirse Ronan. Oh, look at you! And I'll pronounce the next one: <laughs> Meryl Streep in *The Post*. <laughs> she was good in that. But... She was very good in that, and like you've said before, she's going to get nominated if she like blinks. She's going to get nominated. Yeah, so. she was she was very good in that. And I yeah. there's the I've seen some odds makers already saying that she's going to get it for the post because journalists love to vote on journalism movies. But there aren't journalists. Oh, you mean the journalists are saying she's going to get it because they Cause want they her love, to get it? They okay, love okay, to okay, see, okay. Yeah, yeah. They're All not right. voting. Sorry, they're not yeah. voting on the awards, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. But uh, they love to see journalists win or you know mm-hmm. like spotlight, which is you know I don't know if anybody out there remembers my fondness for Spotlight. But it's a great movie. You watch that like every day when I'm at work. I do. I pretend that I don't, but I do. Uh, So Meryl Streep has uh, been favored uh, in many uh, blogs and mainstream uh, articles about this. But I got to say, Sally Hawkins, for my money, fantastic performance. Just a fantastic performance. And even though we have not seen Three Billboards, it seems to me like Frances McDormand is getting the momentum heading into the Oscars. Like telecast so it wouldn't surprise me if if she having not seen it just based on her winning the SAG award and I think she's won a couple other things like it wouldn't surprise me if she won it I uh we need to go see that one that would be that one and I Tanya are probably the next ones oh and so we saw Get Out last night we did on the uh, streaming service known as HBO Go yes What did you think, Coco, of that movie? (laughs) Well... The undefinable, uncategorizable... I almost feel as though I shouldn't really talk about it because... Because it'll be a giveaway? No, I just, like, I'm white, and I feel like me being white and watching that, I'm going to have an entirely different... Yes. Like, there's going to be stuff that I'm going to miss that if I watched it and I were a racial minority, I would not miss. Yeah. I, I mean, aside from the obvious... Slavery is bad and racism is bad. And even well-meaning comments by people who think they are allies are still microaggressions that minorities have to deal with every day that I don't have to deal with. Like the father telling Chris, the main character, I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could have. Like, well-meaning, but you you know, you shouldn't say that to a black kid that you just met. So, you know, trying to be woke. So, but as a as a movie, as a piece of entertainment, as a piece piece of art, what did you think? I I enjoyed it. I thought it was very original. I, I thought so too. I enjoyed the concept. I actually liked the uh, guy whose name we can't pronounce. I <laughs> enjoyed. Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, I enjoyed uh, his performance. Actually, I thought it was like very nuanced. Um, 
Yeah. It I, was that. And I I actually came into it, I knew uh, the plot summary up to him being taken into the basement. So so you knew some spoilers along yeah, the way. Yeah, so I knew some spoilers because I'm not the sort of person who cares about avoiding spoilers. Like, I'll I'll just go on to, like, thelastjedi.net or whatever and, like, read the whole thing the day it comes out. Like, I'm cool with it. But so I knew... You knew that Bruce Willis was dead in The Sixth Sense before... I did, actually. <laughs> did you really? I did, yeah. <laughs> oh, see, that's the total payoff of that movie. <laughs> well, that was an accident. I didn't... Oh, it was accidental. I didn't, yeah, okay. and then from there on, I just got bitter and jaded, and I was like, I don't care about spoilers. But, <laughs> but uh, so I knew, like, all of the plot up to him being taken to the basement, and after that, everything was a surprise to me. I am surprised that that had a happy ending, because those what? aren't... That's a spoiler! Yeah, those uh, those aren't the kinds of movies that have happy endings usually. Mm-hmm. So I was surprised by that, but I was cool with it. Like I was very very cool with him not being oppressed further. Shall we say? You just totally busted that movie. We can put a spoiler alert in the episode description. Well, the other thing is it's now not in theaters anymore, right? Right, so it's exactly. Been a, it's been streaming for a while too. So it came out like last April or May, I think. Yes. So it's been out for a while. Yeah. So just like the people who last week maybe didn't know that the shark eats Quint. In Jaws, <laughs> we have now spoiled Get Out as well. Well, that movie was 1975, <laughs> right. so it's a little bit of a difference, April or 1975. Right. right. So what about you? What did you think about Get Out? I liked it. I thought it was, like you said, uh, at the risk of agreeing with you. I uh, <laughs> At the risk. At the risk of totally <laughs> saying whatever you say. Um, I, I thought it was very original. I liked the storyline. I liked the characters. I liked the development of... Like, the sidekick guy was a little bit predictable. But I thought he was really funny. He was funny. Like, he was much-needed comic relief in that sort of very heavy, yes. like, slavery yes. allegory movie. You yes. Know? True enough. True enough. <laughs> and, and we all know that TSA does not handle Jack. So, <laughs> I mean, that just makes it ironic as well, you know? As someone who travels in and out of the country quite frequently, I will refuse to add to that comment. <laughs> Um, but Moving I thought on. it was good. I thought it was well written. Uh, the, what I had read about it, I hadn't read any plot summaries. Really, was more about the the effect that the story had and and the the way that uh, it had been portrayed and what Jordan Peele had done directing it and everything like that. So I didn't really know a lot about the storyline, which is good because I think mm-hmm. that would have spoiled it. Right. Um, and I like the uh, I like the writing again. The, the character and uh, character development was very good. So I I, I like that. I. I didn't like it as much as I liked um, Darkest Hour, for example. And mm-hmm. looking at the other movies uh, in the best picture that we've talked about, um, The Post has still got to be my favorite. And again, maybe I'm falling into that trap I described earlier about journalists Journalist. want yeah. journalism <laughs> movies to win. Uh-huh. But that one, and for those who have listened to our previous podcast on this... At Which, risk. if you haven't, you should. Please do. Please Available in the it. iTunes uh, store. And and pass it along to your friends. And on Spotify, I believe. We're on Spotify We are as on well. Spotify, yeah. yeah. And maybe YouTube one of these days, too. Yeah. We'll, we'll come to YouTube. And we'll have to dress better than we are dressed right now. <laughs> you, you mean my hot robe isn't a, <laughs> like doing it for potential viewers? It's Victoria's Secret. So oh, that's true, yeah. Uh, but the post, uh, as people will know, I wasn't even going to watch it in the theater. I was going to wait till it streamed. And then I got caught up in it. And I thought, well... Okay, and it, so it's it's still holding that for me, even though I've seen that. Now, I'm very interested to see three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, because I like that cast, and I like that story mm-hmm. uh, idea. Um, the other movies that... Uh, I was surprised, actually, The Florida Project was not in there, because it was much highly touted, and I was looking forward to seeing that one. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not nominated as a Best Picture, so that's, that's one of the surprises for me. I... Uh... I'll pretty much see everything on the Best Picture shortlist. Mm-hmm. There's nine of them. I've seen two. I'll I'll go see all of them. Like I said, The Shape of Water is the one I'm least interested in, but so, you know, I'll watch it again. Um, I, I will uh, say, going back to Get Out just for a moment, Yes, I read that... Or Get Out, as it is said <laughs> by my, my native... Well, that just makes it even more menacing. Like, Get Out! Get Out! Get Out! Get out. Um, <laughs> we don't deal in stereotypes at all here Sorry, on Canada. Canada. Um, the guy who played Chris who has been nominated for Best Actor, is also apparently in Black Panther next month. Oh, yeah. And so he's in it. Chadwick Boseman is in it. And uh, Michael B. Jordan, who played the main character in Fruitvale Station, which we just saw a couple right. weeks ago, right. is also in it. So you are already probably going to get dragged to see Black Panther, but now you're definitely going to get dragged to see Black Panther. So I apologize. I will pay for it. You're 
So Black Panther is going to be your spotlight, is what you're saying. <laughs> An important movie <laughs> for all time. That you're going to go on and on about. <laughs> I'm sorry that you're, nauseum. that you're stuck with somebody who likes superhero movies. No, I not, apologize. I'm not stuck at all. So uh, Willem Dafoe did get nominated for the, the Florida Project, or Project as we say in Canada, for Supporting <laughs> Actor. Um, and there's some uh, other nominees that we won't really go over because if we let, read them all, then it would just be a show of lists. But uh, going back to the best picture, I was going to mention that uh, of movies that we were going to see and not see. So... Uh, Phantom Thread. There was a preview for Phantom Threads, the Daniel Day-Lewis oh. movie, mm-hmm. uh, before one of the movies that I saw today. And I got to say, I'm not going to go see that one. Oh, really? It was like a Merchant Ivory kind of vibe. I, we got to watch Howard's End sometime, man. Come on, let's do it. So does it count if you're watching it on the big screen and I'm watching <laughs> something else on my iPad? You've got hockey on the iPad I've and I'm watching. On the iPad. You know, uh, I did read that fa- uh, Daniel Day-Lewis... For his research for the Phantom Thread, he like deconstructed some kind of 18th century Marie Antoinette type gown, like, and then redid it from like scratch. So, I mean, that guy is insane. So, no wonder the guy is so good, right? Right. Like he gets into his roles. He doesn't just show up on on the first day of shooting and say, "Okay, right, which which camera do I look into?" Like he's <laughs> he's already in it. He's already in the role. He's not Marky Mark, is what you're saying. <laughs> Well, I don't know anything about his preparation his, as a thespian. His, I don't know how much thought he put into Daddy's home too. He might have lived that role for months, right. riding around in a motorcycle with a with a leather jacket on. I mean, he's got a he's probably got a Harley in real life. He's got kids in real life. Like he's he doesn't need any prep work. Like, I, come on, man. I, I, like we were saying previously, I don't think he really stretched a lot for that role or any of his roles. <laughs> Um, I do want to mention the – so I went – the theater that I went to today in our area was one of those big old-fashioned uh, multiplexes. And I can say that now because the multiplex is a kind of an old-fashioned – or it has been around for a while, mm-hmm. the multiplex. Um, this theater was so old that I went to, it actually had heat. What? So you know when you go into the theaters these days and you're just freezing your buns off? Yeah. Like we did in The Last Jedi a couple weeks ago? The Last Jedi? Yeah. yeah it felt like we needed to cut open a tauntaun and get inside. <laughs> <laughs> but this, so this theater was, was that old. The seats were old. It was, uh, it was massive. And it was very uh, sparsely populated with people. Let's just put it that way. Even though it was terrific Tuesday or whatever the bargain uh bargain cost was bargain price of admission was so uh I, the reason i mentioned that is those theaters are still out there it was a fantastic massive huge screen the sound was good it didn't make your ears bleed it wasn't too loud it, it made my ears tingle a little bit oh, okay. not bleed it wasn't like that other theater i went to see when i saw blade runner 2049 i thought i was gonna have a concussion when i came out of that one but um so there are theaters out there so i know it's not uh it's not in fashion these days as much as it used to be to go to the theater and watch a movie. But this sort of reinforced my idea, too, of going to a movie and having it as a big event. And uh, even though I paid $4.50 for a bag <laughs> of candy that I probably got a, got for $1.99 at the grocery store. Well worth it, though. It was well worth it. And uh, I encourage people to continue going to theaters because eventually they're all going to be little small boxes and they're going to be... 14 seats in each one. They're going to be recliners and all that sort of stuff, but it's going to cost you $18 to go. So got to keep these random theaters in downtown areas alive and well and thriving. That's my, (laughs) what do we call that segment? That's the preservation of the arts segment. Like if we were on NBC, it'd be the more you know with the shooting star. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pew. Do they have have sound for that? I think it's shooting star. Da, 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 da. I oh, think that's the little jingle. That's probably forty five thousand dollars right there in, in we can, that jingle. We can cut that out. Okay. <laughs> oh, I want to mention Loving Vincent. Yes. So Loving Vincent, I went to see uh, at an art house type theater near us uh, on the weekend. Nominated for uh, let's see, animated feature. Animated feature, yes. Um, along with the Boss Baby. <laughs> The Breadwinner, Coco, and Ferdinand, all different kinds of movies from Loving Vincent. 
Loving Vincent, of course, is the story of Vincent Van Gogh in his uh, late days of his life and what happened to him. It's actually a bit of a more of a murder mystery, and it's it's got a lot of uh, nuance and it's got a lot of uh, story to it. Uh, and it's not just all flash. So the idea of this of Loving Vincent, it's an animated, essentially on its basic level, it's an animated story told in the painting style of Vincent Van Gogh. So you've got Starry uh, Sky in there. You've got uh, some other works of his at the cafe and stuff like that. They're all referenced in this movie all the way through. So it's very well done. And the characters uh, are people who he's painted in his life. His brother's in there. Uh, there's a man with the yellow jacket in there who's, the, who's the, essentially the, the protagonist in this story. Very well done. Very creatively done. I also encourage people to go see that instead of going to see a Transformers movie or something like that. Because it has – there's some risk taking there. It could, mm-hmm. it could have fallen flat or it could have just been uh, uh, some sort of random technique that people – uh, that d- d- didn't sustain it for the entire movie, but it actually holds up. Right, it's lazy. I I apologize to everybody who was in the crew of the Transformers movies, but <laughs> right. it's lazy just to make another movie where like stuff blows up, right? You know, and like robots do things. But a movie like this, where you're actually animating in the style of one of the world's most well known and well loved artists, like that, that's risky. Yeah, and that was imaginative, and it was. It was more than just a gimmick. Like I said, it was there was story there, and there was some good acting. Like the acting, so the the actors were uh, performed as they would in a normal movie, but then uh, the artistry was the artwork was was uh, put on them, was projected upon them as they were acting. So they took on the colors and everything like that. So there was it's not, in other words, a, a computer generated cartoon, mm-hmm. or it's not just like an old fashioned drawn thing. It mm-hmm. was actually art. It was. Art on top of art. But it was very well done. It was, uh, and it's, it's been held over here for months and months and months. And apparently, it was the most popular movie in the particular art house that uh, they've ever had. Oh, wow. So, uh, and that's been there for a while. It's so. been there for a while. And that doesn't usually happen in our area, mm. our nameless area. Um, <laughs> and the theater was packed. There was a lot of people still in there. Oh, nice. So, it was good. So, uh, Loving Vincent uh, gets my nod. I have seen Coco. And uh, not uh, not just Coco sitting across from me, but Coco, the animated movie. Also a good movie. The Boss Baby, I'm not feeling that one as a legitimate nominee. Uh, did just did you actually seen, see that? Or? I haven't seen that oh, okay. one, but I've seen a lot of it in the previews. Mm-hmm. And and it didn't really get good reviews from what I saw and heard. Uh, Ferdinand is uh, supposed to be pretty good, but not as good as some of the other animated movies. So I would I would say Loving Vincent. So the, the theme of this show is... If I've seen it, it's going to win. <laughs> if I haven't seen it, it's not going to win. <laughs> well, maybe when everything that you say is going to win actually does win, then maybe we could take the podcast like to global. Vegas. Yeah. And like maybe in PR, we'll, uh, you know, hire you to be a movie reviewer or something because you've got like a Good bang track and track record. record yeah. yeah. I only go to see things that win. That's right. I've got really discerning tastes. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay, so anything else on the Oscars that we want to talk about before we move on? Uh, I I don't think so. I think we've covered them, right? I mean, yeah. we're looking forward to it. We're always looking forward to the Oscars. Not well, necessarily the show itself. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to watch the show. Just the actual <laughs> winners. Right. I'm I'm over the Oscars watching them. Just tell me who won and show me the pictures of the dresses yeah. and I'm I'm good. So I don't need to waste four and a half hours sitting there listening to people drone on, you know... Especially like, when you yeah. can follow it on Twitter and you can follow it on Facebook or whatever and you find out who the winners are in real time. Exactly. It's not like you have to sit through all the painfully bad speeches and people, you know, actors that have dropped in and haven't really, they just read off the teleprompter. Yeah. And then the Oscar goes to, like, do and you they, need that? And they always say they're going to cut it down. It's going to go from like 8 to 1030 and instead it's from 8 to like 1245 yeah. and... You're tired and you just want to go to bed and it's just boring and BS. So, so we are not going to be watching the Oscars. So the the relevance factor, who is hosting the Oscars this year? Oh, is it Jimmy Kimmel? It is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You, see, you're way too smart. I, I thought maybe I was going to surprise you on the live to tape podcast, <laughs> but there's no chance of that. Well, speaking of Oscar hosts, uh, James Franco who oh, hosted yeah. several years ago and was apparently baked 
maybe when he was hosting. <laughs> uh, he got shut out for nominations for The Disaster Artist. It picked up adapted sr- screenplay, that nomination, but it didn't get actor or uh, picture, picture yeah. or director. So I just thought I'd throw that in there just to continue our Oscar coverage. And so now I think it's time to move to a new segment to close our podcast. <laughs> it's not going to be versus this this time around. We've come up with it. We're going to have a different segment every time so that you just don't feel that we're predictable out there, dear listener. We're full of ideas. We are. We're full of other things too, but for the sake of this <laughs> which, podcast, it's going to be ideas. Which you've probably figured out by now if you've listened to all five episodes. <laughs> so today's segment, this episode segment is I Don't Get It. <laughs> So, do you want to go first on the I don't get it, or do you want me to go first? You can go first. So, I don't get it. This is what I don't get. I don't get it. So, the segment here, the idea is something that has been accepted main in the mainstream. People love it. People embrace it. But I'm not into it. I don't buy it. I don't understand it. I'm too stupid to figure it out. Stop. Here's one that came to my attention earlier this week. It's the wacky baby names. <laughs> and this came uh, up because of... Uh, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West, and we promise we are not going to talk about the Kardashians a lot. Like, this is going to be one of the rare, rare mentions of the Kardashians because I know everybody's sick of them and they're terrible people. But so Kim and Kanye had a baby within the past few days, their third child. Their first child is a girl named North. Their North se- Northwest. Northwest. No middle name. Northwest. Their second child is a boy, St. West. And their third child, who was just born, is a girl, Chicago West. Now, Kanye's a Chicago guy, but... Wasn't that also a TV show in the 90s? Um, no, Chicago Hope. Chicago Hope. Chicago yeah, Hope. there we go. Okay. And there's also, like, Chicago Fire and, right. like, all that on right now. Right, yeah. right. I think my dad watches Chicago Fire, which tells you the demographic of that. <laughs> <laughs> What's network TV? Who watches network TV anymore? I don't get it. I don't Network get it. TV. That's another segment. <laughs> that is another segment. We're just going to keep rolling with I don't get it <laughs> right, segments. Totally. <laughs> uh, morning TV. We talked about that at one point. I don't I get don't, it. I don't get uh-huh. it. Who gets up in the middle of the night and watches TV the first thing? Like you get up to go to work and get ready and they got the TV on. I don't get it. So, uh, yeah, the wacky baby names. So what are we, what about Brooklyn uh, with uh, Beckham, David Beckham? I don't mind Brooklyn. And Spicy Spice. What's her name? <laughs> Victoria Beckham. Victoria she, Beckham. She was... Oh God! Which Spice Girl was she? <laughs> now this is gonna bother me. I'm, she was like I'm Atletico. You, spice no, or... there was Sporty Spice who was a different girl. Oh, that wasn't Posh sport. Spice. Posh. She was Posh Spice. Look at you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. who were the who were the Spice Girls? What were their names? Uh, posh Baby Ginger. Grumpy, <laughs> Grumpy Spice. <laughs> yeah. Well, Scary. There was a Scary oh, Spice. Scary. So I was you're close. close. I was. Close. And then Sporty. So yeah. Okay. And. Uh, I don't. I don't mind Brooklyn, Brooklyn? but but then there because that's at least actually Decker a place too? name. Decker. Yeah, Brooklyn Decker, who is married to Andy Roddick. Oh, <laughs> so it's a completely different thing. Yeah, but they had a baby, but I don't know what that baby's name is. Yeah. But anyways, so um, yeah, so there. At least that's an actual place name, so that's a proper name. So you're okay that, with Brooklyn, but you're not okay with Chicago. No, Chicago. or is it the combination of Chicago and West? I think it's both. I okay. think it's I think it's a dumb name, and okay. then you put West on it, and it makes it worse. Yeah. And then there are actual baby names that aren't really names, like Audio Science, and Moon Unit, <laughs> Moon Unit, and Pilot Inspector. <laughs> like, why? Why do you do that to your kids? Poor kids. I don't get it. Well, and also, uh, what's your stance on Apple Martin? No. Apple being Chris Martin and Gwyneth Paltrow's no offspring. No. What What, what about you? Apple? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, especially considering in one of the Coldplay songs, he sings, shoot an apple off my head. Oh, yeah. Which uh, one is that? It's uh... I think it's a scientist. Anyway, okay, so yeah. <laughs> I, whenever I hear that lyric, I'm thinking, what are you doing? That's your offspring. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. There, uh, there is one wacky baby name, celebrity baby name that I, I love. Yeah. I would never name my own child that, but... Mm-hmm. I, I love it. I think it's adorable. Uh, Pendulette, I believe. Pendulette? Of, of Penn and Teller named his daughter Moxie Crime Fighter. <laughs> and I love that name. That name is adorable. I would, so you're okay yeah. with Moxie Crime Fighter, but you're not okay with Pilot Inspector? <laughs> or Audio Science. No. I'm not okay with either one but of those. But Pilot Inspector is sort of like a profession, and, and that's also a profession. No. 
No? No, there are some lines that shouldn't be crossed. All right. So. What, uh, what would be another good baby name? A good wacky baby name? I don't know. I'm sure we could probably bust out the Google machine and we could figure out other weird baby names. Like Tree Limb. Tree, <laughs> tree Limb. Oh, uh, Soleil Moonfry. She was Punky Brewster in the 80s. Punky Brewster? <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think it's time we wrapped up the show for another week. This being our Oscar nomination special edition. ba 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 Oscars. ba 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 you should see the uh, hand gestures and faces that he's making while he's doing that as well. It's We do need a video component. This will be coming to the YouTube version of this show very shortly. <laughs> Ratings gold. You know what we did? Did we do I'm Not Coco, I'm Not Adults? No, we didn't. I was waiting for you to do that at the beginning. I was so excited to get into the Oscars, I forgot. <laughs> well, see, this is a special edition. This signifies it was a special edition because I didn't do that off the top. Okay. So, for another week on the podcast, I'm Not Coco. And I'm Not Adults. <laughs>